Hey guys, welcome to Digital Screeny channel on YouTube. And in this video, we are going to have a quick look at how we can perform image segmentation, semantic segmentation using small data sets. And this is a common scenario, right? I mean, you don't have the luxury sometimes of having very large data sets, or you probably have a large data set, but you don't have the patience or uh, you know the drive to annotate thousands of images. That's probably not a good use of your time. So you end up only annotating 10 images, 15 images, 20 images. So in this example, I'm going to use about 12 images with uh, annotated objects, about 150 of those, okay? And this is our familiar mitochondria data set, and I'll show you where you can get your hands onto this data set so you can practice it the way I'm showing it to you. So, uh, let's, uh, uh, let me jump in and then show you exactly where to get the data set, and then let's look at the code. Okay, so on your Google search, go ahead and type electron microscopy data set and also add the keyword EPFL. It'll take you to this page and each image here, when you download these images and corresponding masks, it would be, uh, I, I believe each image is 1K by 768, 1024 by 768 and corresponding masks, right? So you have 165 of these images and 165 corresponding masks. So if you use the entire data set, that's not small data, that is pretty big data. I'm going to take only 12 images out of this data set. And uh, if you want, you can take 12 masks out of corresponding masks of this data set and use those as starting point. I said if you want, because in my case, I took 12 images and I did my own annotations just because. Okay, to see where my patience ends. Okay, and I just took a couple of hours to uh, label some of these. And how did I label them? Well, I went to appear.com. I mentioned about this quite a few times in the past. So uh, it's free. Go ahead and sign up for www.appear.com and go to files, upload the file you would like to annotate, and click on the I button right there right next to the file that you would like to annotate. It opens up in a 3D, uh, I mean in an external viewer, like, like the one you see on the screen. And uh, now on the left-hand side, you just click on add the class. By the way, click on this head that says machine learning and add a class. In this, my example, this is mitochondria, okay? Once you add the class, then you can go ahead and let me, uh, let me erase the last one. Let me delete the last one so we can add it again. So you just click on this uh, brush tool or you can use any of these tools to uh, kind of define your annotation. So I'll just zoom in and then paint these annotations right there and then hit enter. So that's recorded, escape, I'm done with this annotation, okay? And you can go through the slices, like uh, if you go to dimensions, you can go through the Z stack. In this case, I should have 12 images. So you go through each and one of these images, right? And then you kind of do this painting. And my patients, well, at least I devoted a couple of hours to do this, and after that, I ended up with 12 images. And these are the images uh, I'm going to use, and when you export these, go ahead and uh, select, for example, labeled image and mitochondria and download it. Then you'll have a, a TIFF file, excuse me, a TIFF file that is a binary image, zero for the background and one for the pixels uh, you know, uh, that you have labeled as mitochondria. Okay, so this is uh, this is how I ended up with, uh, do I have them open? Yeah, I ended up with this and this. So I should have 12 of these images, okay? And 12 of these corresponding masks. Now, if you are new to these type of image extractions, uh, uh, I talked about image J, which is, uh, uh, which is a must if you want to work with images, okay? So here you can open the, the data set you just downloaded with all the 165 images. You can go ahead and download it. And if you want to extract 12 images from the image stack and also from the mask stack, you just need to image stacks tools and slice keeper for example go ahead and do slice keeper and then say my first slide is, slice is number one and the last slice is 165 because in the original data set you have 165 uh, images and then my increment is 20 or so so you end up with how many ever 164 divided by 20 right so that many images this is exactly how I down uh, I, I uh, separated or uh, you know the 12 images I'm trying to uh, analyze right now so these are the exact 12 images and this is a TIFF image and this is a TIFF stack meaning it's not just one single image it's a stack of 12 images 
Okay, so far so good, I hope. Now let's jump into the code to understand what's going on. Now I'm doing a couple of things. Uh, I think this training is done on Google Colab. I'm, I have trained a pre-trained model, which is a ResNet 32 that has been uh, 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 trained on ImageNet. And so it has like pre-trained weights. My, uh, I was a bit curious in terms of, okay, how does this compare against uh, something from scratch? So in this case, I'm, uh, I think I'm, um, as you can see, I'm still training there, 29th epoch of 50. So by the time we are done looking at the other one, they should be ready. So here I'm, uh, uh, I'm training a regular standard unit. This is the one that we have used in the past, where you just have a uh, you know a regular encoder and a decoder there, not pre-trained. We are going to train everything from scratch using our binary cross entropy as loss function, Adam as optimizer, and accuracy as our metrics. That's it. Okay. And uh, anything on this slide now? Actually, one other thing I would like to mention is when it comes to these pre-trained models, I'm going to use, uh, like I said, ResNet, and you can use any of these. And if you watched my previous tutorials, you know that the library that we are going to use is called segmentation models, okay? This library, if you work with the latest TensorFlow 2. Point whatever, 2.x, okay? It's going to throw you an error saying that, uh, where did I write it down? It's going to throw you an error that says, uh, oh, I thought, oh, uh, that says uh, generic utilities uh, is, uh, you know, cannot find generic utilities under Keras or something of that sort. The reason is uh, in this library, under efficient net, if you go to init.py, they have a wrong line there. They have the old line, which is uh, get this custom objects from utils.generic utilities. This doesn't exist anymore. So it's going to throw you an error. So all you need to do is find this init.py file in your local installation and then change, remove this generic utilities part and then just keep this get custom objects and uh, update and everything should work on your local system. Just in case in, you run into that. You will run into that on Google Colab because there isn't much you can do on Colab, right? I mean, I cannot find this lib uh, and edit this. So what can I do? Uh, I think my graphics card just died. Let's see why the graphics card died. And this is uh, this is a thing that happens when you're using GPU for like training and also for this video recording and all that. So you see my it says unable to allocate that much uh, that much shape. So it kind of died right in the middle. So let me compromise on uh, something and then restart this training. Don't worry, it's not going to uh, make this video any longer. Instead of 50, just a second. Sorry about the uh, issue here. So uh, no, I'm in the. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Instead of 50, let me go ahead and change my steps per epoch to. Uh, I'll explain this when we get here. Let's just change this to steps per epoch, just in case. And. Uh, I, these type of things uh, I hate when they happen during live video recording, but it, these are useful. So you know that, oh, that's that's exactly what happened, right? So let us uh, let me go ahead and restart this kernel. In fact, let me close this and then restart this, but I'll, I'll, I'll restart this video just in a second. Let me go ahead and pause this, okay? Okay, so I had to restart my spider. So let's see, I, uh, right now, instead of uh, steps per epoch uh, 50, I changed it to like 20, I guess. So let's see if this, this kind of helps a little bit. So let's uh, go ahead and start this. And while that's running, let me go back to the Colab and then look at these line by line. So we were discussing about, okay, why I'm using TensorFlow 1.x. That's because segmentation models is throwing an error. Otherwise, you, you obviously you would like to use the latest TensorFlow. That's the only reason I did that. And then I'm going to install Patchify because now I have large images of 1024 by 768. I'd like to cut them down to uh, patches of 256 by 256, train it. So to do that, Patchify is the best way, okay? So that's why I'm installing it there. Uh, the Keras version is 2.3.1. This is because I roll back the TensorFlow version, so this is not the latest uh, Keras, but still, it's, it's, it's okay. It's still using GPU and all that. And uh, the real uh, reason why I did all of that is my segmentation models uh, library has a bug. We already talked about it. So go ahead and pip install segmentation models. Again, why am I doing segmentation models? Because it makes it easy for me to define pre-trained uh, networks, pre-trained weights as encoder part of my unit. 
Otherwise, if I have to write this entire thing, then that's not the efficient way of doing things anyway. So let's go ahead and install uh, segmentation models. And now let's coming down. I'm using Patchify other, otherwise, uh, and also TIFF file, because this is a TIFF. If you just use, I think, OpenCV, it doesn't know what to do with TIFF stack. So it only reads the first image. You can use scikit image actually to read this because scikit image uses TIFF file in the back end uh, if you're opening TIFF files. Okay, so uh, uh, there it is. And then I'm uh, obviously go ahead and train with all 165 images if you want. So I'm leaving these lines open. Uh, so I mean commented so you can do it uh, on, the, on your own. But uh, for this exercise, I'm going to use only 12 images. And of course they are on my Google Drive. Uh, which I have linked. So here is the direct link to my images and masks. I hope so far everyone's following. And these images again uh, are 12 by 768 by 1024. What does that mean? I have 12 images, each image 768 by 1024, right? So we know that. So we already know that these images are, uh, uh, there you go, 1024 by 768. How many of them? 12. Again, I'm repeating this just to make sure there is no miscommunication uh, you know, in this video. Okay, now what am I doing in this part? So here I'm taking all those 12 by 768 by 1024 and for each of those images in my image stack, I am going to apply patchify for each image. So here, my first image is image number zero. The next one is image number one. How many of these I'm doing? 12, right? Because this is the shape of our, uh, of our image, right? 12, again, basics, but be patient now into what size patches. I'm doing 256 by 256 size patches. And then I said, okay, jump 256 pixels. That means I don't have any overlap between these pixels. Okay, so 256, 256 and 256. So how many do we have? If it is a seven, uh, 768, three of them, right? 256 times three is 768 and 256 times four is 1024. So we should have three by four after I'm done with this. Okay. So now I'll have three by four. Again, watch watch my video on Patchify. I think this is tips and tricks number four or five. Go back and check. Uh, I think it's tips and tricks number five. Go back and, uh, and check that video if you don't know what I'm talking about. So after this, we should have an array of three by four by 256 by 256 by one. So I'm going to go through each of those three images and then each of those four images and then divide that image by 255 because we need to scale those between zero to one, right? The pixel values. And uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, append that as a patch to my images array, okay? So that, that's that and then comes, uh, why am I doing this? So this is, let me quickly explain. So at this point, when you do this, you only have a uh, an array of how many ever images you have right? So I think you'll have 144 images because remember three by four, how many three by four patches? 12 images. So 12 times 12, 144. Uh, sorry for using a lot of math, but uh, if you want to be a data scientist, you better be good at math. Okay. So at this point, we'll have 12, I mean, sorry, 144 by 256 by 256 by one. That's the size in a uh, array. Now, the ResNet that I'm going to use expects a RGB type of image, meaning three channel image. So instead of 256 by 256 by one, I need 256 by 256 by three, okay? So that's why I'm kind of multiplying that, uh, uh, you know, the number of channels are copying those three times to create that. That's the, this, that, that's the, exactly the reason why I'm doing that here, okay? Next. I'm doing exactly the same for uh, for my masks. Obviously for masks, I don't need RGB masks or masks. These are ground truth. So except for this step, everything else should be exactly the same, okay? So that's what I'm trying to do here, okay? And I'm dividing by mask by 255 because in my case, for whatever reason, I converted my masks. They have originally a pixel value of one. I was using this for a different experiment. So in my case, I had these pixel values as 255. If you look at, up here, you see when I put my mouse there, the value is 255. So the background is zero. The uh, the peak here is, uh, sorry, not peak, the pixel value of the mitochondria is 255. That's why I'm dividing them by 255, so it becomes one again. If you already start with one, don't you don't need to do that. Okay, I, I hope that makes sense. That's it, once we are done with this, we should have 
let's look at the shape of this like like we mentioned 144 images right three by four patches in each image and 12 images so we have 144 each image is 256 by 256 by 3 again why 3 because that's exactly what our ResNet expects as input for the shape okay and we got 3 because we we did this uh, NP dot stack okay now here we have 144 images, 256 by 256 by one. This is for masks, right? I mean, we don't need uh, all these three. Okay, and uh, I'm looking at the unique values in my mask. What are the unique values in my mask? It's zero and one. So my background is zero and the pixel value of mitochondria is one. I know I'm discussing this quite a bit, but every understanding this is very important. Next, I'm importing segmentation models as SM, yes. It imported you see how it's using keras framework in the back end and then what now i'm defining my backbone as resnet 34 and you need to pre-process your input data the way it got pre-processed using resnet 34 and segmentation models makes it easy for us to do that all you need to do is from segmentation models you have to use get pre-processing method and then whatever that backbone is so this gets what the how to pre-process and then just apply that onto your images right i mean our images are 144 these images go ahead and pre-process your images and after pre-processing the shape should not change it's obviously pretty much the same shape it's except the image when i say pre-process it's normalizing or scaling or whatever that that pre-processing step is it's very important to do this otherwise your your uh, network may not converge okay so uh do that and now we are almost there we just need to separate our uh, training and testing data sets this is pretty clear how we do that and i'm saving 25 percent for testing don't make this mistake of saying oh you have a small data set only 144 images remember we have 12 images uh, large images and we cut them down into uh, 144 patches right three by four from each image and 12 images. Again, same math over and over. So of those, um, uh, uh, you cannot just say, oh, I need more data for training. Uh, so let me just get 90% for training and only 10% for testing. No, that's because if you, if you, if you don't have enough testing data size, then uh, you, you'll get some ridiculous uh, learning curves and you don't know what to do with that. You don't know if your model is trained well or not. So you do need enough train validation or testing size here. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm separating 25%, which means I have 108 images for training, 36 images for uh, validation. I hope you're following. This is absolutely the bare minimum. In fact, this is probably not even enough. Okay, so what do we do next? Now I'm just doing sanity check. I always do this because you, we have done a lot here. We divided images into patches. We loaded images and masks as separate images. Now, how do I know that these are actually matching? So before training, before spending all that time, go ahead and just check a few random images. I always use random number generator and then say, okay, just show me the image and also the mask, right? I mean, from my X train and Y train, just show me the same number. So that matches very well. That matches very well. I think we are, I think we are good, <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that also matches very well. So, so far so good, go ahead and continue. Now I'm going to use a generator. Without this, the results will be crappy. So what is a generator? Again, this is uh, data augmentation. Watch my video on data augmentation. I'm using Keras pre-processing image data generator. And I'm also uh, setting a seed equal to 24, whatever that number is. Why? Because I want to use the same seed for my images and masks. So when the transformation happens, it's exactly the same transformation. I want images and masks to be augmented exactly the same way so they match every time the augmentation happens. The only way you can ensure that is by uh, keeping the seed constant between these two, whatever that seed number is, okay? Now, another little minor thing that I'm gonna talk about here is, uh, this is my image data generator arguments, and these are my mask data generator arguments. I want them to be exactly the same. Ideally, I wouldn't even define two separate ones here. I would just use one data generator arguments and use it for both images and masks. And the reason why I have them separated here is, I wanted to add this extra line to uh, my mask data generator. That's because in the past when I have done uh, image augmentation for masks, especially if you do rotation or zoom in 
are shear, what happens is uh, when when the when the objects are moved or rotated, it's it's actually filling the the space with uh, with some sort of an interpolated value. I hope this makes sense. For example, if you have zero and two fifty five. 0 is background, 255 is your uh, mitochondria. When you rotate it, when it's rotated, uh, certain places, because rotation, right? I mean, it's not just translation. Rotation means, okay, what do I do with these pixel pixels in between? So it actually filled it with some sort of interpolated value. So you'll see some values at 200 or uh, 220 or 230, right? This is, this is, not, this is, this, this is not acceptable for semantic segmentation. You either want zero or 255. In our example, you either want zero or one, that's it. So what ha uh, I have done here is, after any of these augmentation for masks, go ahead and uh, do this lambda function, execute this lambda function. What does that lambda function do? Well, if the pixel value is any value above zero, it's going to convert that into one, that's it. If it's 0 0.8, if it's 0 0.3, it doesn't matter. I know my background is zero. I know my uh, whatever the uh, you know uh, the pixel values that are non-zero should be one. Okay, that's exactly why I added this line. Okay, hopefully it makes sense. Also, in the past I made a video in terms of be careful when you're doing augmentation. Do not do a lot of rotations. In this case, I'm okay doing 90 degrees and also up to 30% of shift in width and height and also shear of 50% because I'm doing exactly the same for both images and masks, okay? then it's okay. If you're only doing classification problem, then you need to be a bit careful in terms of uh, being aggressive when you're, uh, when you're doing your image augmentation, okay? So far, again, so, uh, hopefully it's good. And then I, these are just arguments, right? And I need to go ahead and uh, uh, define an image generator with the arguments we just defined with these uh, generator arguments. And uh, I'm fitting it onto my X train, okay? And the same thing, image data generator uh, dot flow. Actually, let me uh, explain this a little bit. So here I have defined my image data generator and here I'm actually uh, fitting it. And sometimes fitting, I mean, fitting is optional, but it's actually required if you are doing some, some uh, sort of normalizations or some sort of operations. So I kind of do it, uh, you know, by default, it doesn't matter. And then I, here I am getting, uh, using dot flow to say, to basically mention that, okay, from X train, go ahead and uh, get the data. Okay, if, it, if you're reading it from a local directory, it would be flow from directory. Again, these are basics you probably know, but you know, it doesn't hurt to hear them again. And this is very important. Seed equals to seed, seed equals to seed. That means my seed in this case is equal to 24. So every time it's doing something, the exact same thing is done even for my validation image generator right there. Okay, so for my validation image generator image, uh, it's again flowing from X test, right? This is where our validation is coming from. So training is from coming from train and X test, but my seed is exactly the same. So anytime any operation happens, it's exactly the same. Okay, and uh, 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 and I'm also doing uh, mask data generator, and you know um, where the mask is coming from, right? I mean, these are the arguments from mask data generator arguments, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. Mask data generator arguments. Other, otherwise, everything else is exactly the same, but we are applying this onto our Y train data set and not obviously X train. So. And uh, once I have those, I am going to combine those uh, using the zip, like, okay, image generator and mask generator. So whenever I call my generator here, it's going to give me both image and mask generator right there. Okay, so you see my image mask generator, it's going to give me image generator and mask generator, which means when later on when I do model.fit, I just need to give my generator, that's it, not just X and Y. You can just separate this if you want, but this is, this is how I chose to uh, provide. And I also have validation data generator, okay? So this is basically our generator right there. Now the question is, again, this is uh, uh, a sanity check again really are the transformations happening exactly the same between my uh, my uh, image and mask. So here uh, a couple of lines where we are just loading the data and then going through one by one. So that makes sense, right? So this is transformed. This is not real data right now that you're seeing on the screen. This is actually augmented data or transformed data using one of these transformations, shear or whatever those transformations are. So let's look at the next image in this series. So nothing, that's good. Next image, 
yeah that's that looks pretty good and next image so yeah everything looks good i do this all the time because i get paranoid about things matching otherwise you do training and everything it doesn't matter if you're not training it on the right type of data right so uh i i i spend enough time staring at these believe me this is this is going to save you a lot of uh, a lot of time and uh, yeah so i'm at, at this point i should say i'm very happy with uh, the the way augmentation is performing and then that's it now i'm going to bring what is my model we have to define the model my model is from segmentation models get unit with a backbone of resnet 32 and encoder weights of imagenet okay so now we have the weights and everything and now i'm going to compile it using adam and uh, uh, bce jacquard loss which is intersection over union type of loss okay so intersection over union is also our metrics now i think uh, one of you or a couple of you have asked me like how can intersection over union be used as a loss function isn't intersection over union non-differentiable and can't uh, loss functions be differentiable the way this this is written it is actually differentiable and i'll probably make another video on that topic if you guys are interested uh, uh or probably refer you to your paper uh, where you can uh, uh, first i have to find it i know i have read it sometime in the past but either way you can use intersection over union as a loss function okay and that's exactly what i'm doing here and uh, everything else is pretty much printing the uh, printing it and here i am like i mentioned earlier model.fit my generator right there okay and validation data is uh, using our data generator and i'm using 50 steps per epoch which is what i tried to uh, use uh, uh, on my uh, on my uh, sorry on my other model but actually the GPU was crashing while I'm recording the video so I changed this uh, a little bit but anyway uh, steps per epoch 50 validation steps 50 number of epochs 50 so after those 50 epochs it's it's not a great training curve as you can see because we don't have a lot of data you see how my validation IOU is jumping up and down, maybe 20, 30 more epochs. I'll probably get something uh, to be settled down, but this is a bit slow. Uh, I stopped it right here. You see, it's not that bad, actually. I mean, the training and validation loss, I think uh, this is practically useless to kind of uh, interpret anything from there. But if you just look at the intersection over union right there, this is this is not bad, except for this, it's, it's coming back. I mean, you will have occasional jumps, right? So this will come back, but I'm overall I'm I'm okay uh, looking at these two, the separation between training and validation IOU. I'm not okay with this being only at 50%. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see on uh, actual data right there. So here I'm at uh, it's 80% actually. That's pretty good. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is on the X test data set, I'm predicting it and then I'm thresholding it. Anything above 0.5, okay, give me, uh, say that, okay, that, that's a mitochondria. Below 0.5 is uh, background. And uh, I'm just calculating intersection over union. 80% is not bad, actually, for, for, for uh, you know, only 12 large images or 144 or 108, I think, uh, right? I mean, the remaining ones we used for uh, validation. So let's see how it's working on some of these uh, images. So you see, this is the uh, this is the issue. You see, my testing the actual label has nothing in here, but my prediction is showing me some something here. Okay, this is uh, if I trained it a few more epochs, maybe I'll get there. But uh, but this can be easily taken care of when you do your object analysis and say, hey, any object below certain size, it's not mitochondria. You can you can get away with that. Yeah. So, but let's see if it's de detecting actual mitochondria. That's not bad. It's actually detecting actual mitochondria. Maybe I should threshold this. I see, you see the edges are blurred. That's probably because I'm, pro uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not uh, thresholding that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just doing prediction is model, uh, model dot predict. If I actually put, uh, uh, you know, greater than 0 0.5, maybe some of these images are a bit, uh, uh, a bit cleaner but let's let's look at a few more this is fun yeah that's not bad i mean it's getting this and that correct and in addition it's actually getting a couple more right here i don't blame it because if you look at this bottom right it looks like it's mitochondria yeah and let's do this one more time yeah here it's 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 not complete yet so 
I don't know what you interpret from this. My interpretation is, yeah, it's doing a decent job. Actually, if you look at this, it's actually doing a pretty good job. But if you only have a handful of images, you may have to do some post-processing by saying that, okay, anything that's smaller, I mean, this image is good, but let's actually see. Uh, oh, wow, that's not bad. In fact, that's amazing. It's, uh, okay, I'm trying to find a bad one so I can explain. Okay, so here you can actually see, okay, these three are there. In fact, uh, I don't blame I don't blame my prediction. Again, here it looks like a mitochondria. So it is uh, doing a decent job, but if you think it's not doing a decent job, you can set a threshold and you can remove those. So uh, this is, this is oh, actually, I tend to, uh, I tend to like my predictions here more than the t actual labels you see this could be this could be an actual mitochondria okay so what did we get 80 percent of iou and this is this seems to be not not bad this is acceptable uh, and these things can be thresholded out i mean if you have little things like this just do some object analysis after your semantic segmentation and say any object that's smaller than certain size uh, go ahead and ignore them in fact i would stitch all these images together you follow my video on how to segment large images and then apply this object uh, you know uh, th uh, thresholding part object uh, removing part okay now let me go ahead and see yeah this is done here uh, and what I have done here is instead of using transfer learning, I just started learning from scratch using the standard unit model. Okay. And everything is exactly the same. I don't even need to go through any of these because we already did. Yeah. The input image, input mask, the way I'm doing, the way I'm uh, uh, scaling these, everything is the same. The only difference is the model that I'm using here. That's it. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay, so you see the way I'm splitting. So I'm, let me not even not discuss any of this. This is the part that's actually different. Okay, I'm just getting the model from my simple unit model, which is exactly this one. So let's focus on the results actually. Uh, where are we? So the data generator is also the same. You see, uh, pre-processing function, nothing different there. Image data generator, all of this code is identical. And uh, one thing I'd like to focus on is at least mention is steps per epoch in the other one. I used 50 steps per epoch. Here I am using something different uh, for GPU reasons. And uh, steps, normally what do you do when you do image generator? Your steps per epoch is the, your total training data divided by batch size. But my total da training data is 108. My batch size is 16. So I, I'm like, okay, uh, let me augment a bit more. So I multiplied this by three. So what do we get? Steps per epoch. I think that's 20, if I'm not wrong. If I go here, steps per epoch. Yeah, it's 20. I'm doing 20 steps per epoch in this case. So just going a little bit over what the con normal convention is. Well, if you have uh, thousands of images, then it's typically how many ever images you have divided by the batch size, right? So that's the only difference here. Otherwise, uh, let's look at the plots. So yeah, pretty much the same. You see the accuracy is jumping. That's because we don't have enough validation data. Again, if you watch my video on how to interpret learning curves, you'll understand that if your, uh, if your validation loss is jumping up and down, that basically means it's, it's, you don't have enough uh, validation data. It's so you're not getting a consistent uh, result there. But if you look at your training curves, yeah, it's the loss is going down. This hopefully is generally trending down, but this is, I, I don't like the look of this, <laughs> by the way. So let's go down and uh, print the IOU value. This should be horrible. Yeah, only 29%. So uh, if I go, I have done this. If I uh, if I do steps per epoch as 50, this actually goes up to like about uh, 45 to 50 percent. Okay, but still with transfer learning, you're getting much better accuracy compared to uh, starting, uh, you know, the the training from scratch. So uh, let's let's go ahead and look at the results and then draw some conclusions. Okay, so let's look at exactly the same type of uh, analysis we have done. You see, this is our true label. Let me expand this a bit. Okay, this is our true label and this is what we got. We actually got an entirely new mitochondria there, but it doesn't even exist there, right? I mean, it's not even logical. So let's let's do this one more time. Another random image. 
and see you see how you're getting all this other crap now you can clean that up like i said but uh, this is a bit too much to clean up yeah i'm not happy with this result you see right there okay so we have seen two ways to do this one using a pre-trained network and pre-trained weights like resnet 32 or whatever try try others it's always a good idea to start from somewhere so transfer learning if you have limited training data lesson one use augmentation try the same exercise without augmentation the results will be horrible lesson two use transfer learning okay that way you're getting decent results of course always uh, the uh, try to collect more data i mean if you can but i understand that you always uh, you probably do not have access to a lot of data that's why you're doing this limited uh, uh, training anyway okay uh, or just try the try the uh, unit on a peer because uh, here uh, try these you know under machine learning go ahead and annotate train and segment because what we have done here uh, is use a unit with efficient net and it actually works great on these data sets which i have done you know 12 training images and uh, it's it does certain tricks so you get even uh, better uh, well let me just say when it comes to augmentation it uses certain types of elastic augmentation which has been proven to improve the uh, semantic segmentation results okay uh, these are all custom written so i cannot i cannot show those to you maybe try using augmentations or something you know if they have these type of uh, augmentation but augmentation does help a little bit but you cannot just augment your way uh, from 100 images to 1000 to 10000 images okay so in summary let's go ahead and put this on the uh, sorry uh, let's go ahead and put this on the screen so we end this on a very nice happy note there so because we got excellent results using transfer learning so this is a great lesson i hope so I know you love this video because it's after about 35 to uh, 38 minutes you're still with us so go ahead and subscribe to this channel and uh, like this video thank you guys